Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. Nehemiah, chapter 1. Last time was our introduction to this book, and it deals with the return of the Jews to Jerusalem following their captivity in Babylon, much as the book of Ezra did. So let's get started and read the first four verses of chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. And reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The words of verse 1 the month Chislu and uh, Shushan the palace locate the time and place of the, the uh, events. Um, on the Old World calendars, the month Chislu, at least for the Jews, was approximately November 25th to December 25th, in the Old World calendars. At least how, how, that's how they rough, that time period roughly corresponds with our solar calendars today. Shushan is uh, obviously the king's palace, and it was located in the uh, territory called Susiana, S-U-S-I. A-N-A, -A. that's east of the Tigris River, that area is now part of Iran. And um, the phrase, the 20th year, in verse 1, is taken by all the standard chronologies to be 20 years after the final destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And that period of 70 years was roughly... 598 B.C. until 528 B.C. And I think we covered that when we were in the book of Ezra. So it would mean the expression, the 20th year, um, might be somewhere near 578 or 575 B.C., 20 years after. The, or it could be 20 years after the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire which would put the date of this writing about 518 B.C. But the dates are not that important for our purposes. But as far as historical information, things that happened so long ago, it's very difficult for historians to put an accurate date on many of the events, largely because the world followed a, um, more of a lunar calendar, uh, which had more months all based on a 28, 29 day or 30 day cycle. And ours, our solar calendar in our 12 months, the, the, the length of the number of days varies from month to month. But uh, in the old world, the, the beginning of the year would be around springtime, the start of springtime, when, when everything in the world is new. Um, I mentioned my sermon on Sunday was called, it's, uh, it's a New Year, so why have you failed already? And you'd be surprised the morons that post comments under my video on YouTube, don't you know that the New Year isn't in December or January, it happens in March. That's, that's not the point, that's irrelevant. I'm talking about the calendar year, you dumb doofus. But there's plenty of those who, um, and hopefully they'll watch this video and know that I'm talking about them. But, uh, but fortunately, there's someone else who comments on their comment and saying, he's, he's not saying that the new year is uh, January 1st, but for all practical purposes, it is. You know, the entire world, except for the Chinese and the Jews who still have a traditional calendar, uh, part of their, either their cultural history or in the Jews' religious calendar, otherwise, for all commerce, it's all based on 
our calendar starting in January 1st. The entire world has adopted it. Uh, over 100 years ago, in 1900, that was not the case. There were still a number of countries following the old world calendar, and only around at, at 2000, the beginning of another century, marked the first time every country in the world was following the same uh, solar calendar that we follow now for, for trade and commerce and so forth. I mean, you have your cultural calendar that, that's based on the old world system, but when I say it's a new year, I think everybody understood. I'm not forcing some new, you know, Catholic Pope adopted thing down your throats. But there are a lot of simple minds out there who happened upon our channel. Anyway, um, so Nehemiah says in verse 2, Hanani, or Hanani, one of my brethren, and then he says, and certain men of Judah. I want you to notice Nehemiah 7, page or two forward, Nehemiah 7, and uh, I'll read the first two verses. Now it came to pass when the wall was built and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah the ruler of the palace charge and so forth. So it's it's probably a safe bet to say that this uh, Hanani or Hanani was uh, not just a fellow Jew brother of Nehemiah, but also a family brother. <laughs> it's based on those the wording of those two places. And um, so uh, Hanani or Hanani and certain men of Judah have just returned from to Persia from Palestine with a report concerning the condition of the land and the city and the people in Jerusalem. And they mention, they mention a remnant of Jews who were not taken into captivity when the Babylonians came in. Uh, in fact, go forward, or, uh, yeah, go forward to the book of, no, backwards, uh, 2 Kings, 2 Kings, and chapter 25. 2 Kings 25. Uh, and notice there verse 12. 2 Kings tw uh, 25 verse, oh, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carry away. But the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land to be vine dressers and the husbandmen. So not all the Jews were carried away to be slaves, uh, servants, and captive in Babylon when the Babylonians took over. They left some behind. The poor, who probably they probably figured uh, have no value to us, they have no job skills, we can't put them to work. They're probably all uneducated and meager farmers at best. They left those people behind. And the first time I read that, going through my Bible, it, and, it, and it dawned on me, it jumped out at me. There has always been, even in troublesome times, even in the great captivity of uh, Babylon, there has always been some Jewish presence in the land, in that part of the world. Even when there was no um, state of Israel, there was no actual government, there was no capital city that the people could rally around, there was no kingdom at all. And nevertheless, God has always left some Jews scattered in that part of the world. There were Jews living in Iran up until the oh, the 1970s when the, the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini took over and all the radical Islam began to grow uh, and they saw we need to flee for our lives, but they were able to live in peace in that part of the world, a relative peace in that part of the world for a long time. But there's always been some a Jewish presence, however small, however insignificant, uh, living in the land of Israel, Palestine. 
ever since God gave it to Abraham and his descendants. But they say, um, and that, that verse is also repeated in the Jer book of Jeremiah and in the book of Isaiah. But um, they say the wall around Jerusalem is broken down, verse 3, and the gates of the city as well. So the inhabitants of that city have no protection from many outside invaders. Uh, Nehemiah's reaction to this is fourfold. Look at verse 4. It came to pass when I had heard these words that I sat down, number one, and wept. That's the actual shedding of tears. And mourn. That's the grief, even if, if tears are not flowing down. And fasted. That's self-explanatory. To fast and lastly, prayed. Fasted and prayed. And um, he was extremely uh, heartbroken, disappointed, grieved to hear the, the condition of Jerusalem, the condition of the people, the plight of the people, and the condition of the land marred up. Uh, probably every field, every farm had been torn up and um, by the invading armies. <clears throat> but notice verses 5, 6, and 7 tonight. <clears throat> Here, speaking of his own words, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine, actually, before we go any further, go back to the book of Exodus. Exodus and Exodus 20. Exodus 20, here Moses is writing the, the commandments that God had given to, given to him. Exodus 20, and uh, after he says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself, in verse 5, to, this, to uh, images. Verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them, notice, that love me, and keep my commandments. That was, that, it, that summarizes the relationship God had with the sinner in the Old Testament. His mercy and his compassion and patience with you was largely conditioned upon your measure of obedience to him and keeping the laws he had given. So back to Nehemiah chapter 1. He, he rehearses that fact with God. Uh, verse 5 again, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. I want you to hold your place here. Go back, if you will, just a couple pages, one, maybe one page, Ezra chapter 9. Ezra 9, let's see the prayer that Ezra made. Along these same lines, beginning at verse 5. Ezra 9, starting at verse 5, and at the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses grown up under the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, for our iniquities have we, uh, have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Now, verse 10, 
And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Also go forward to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Seems like um, Nehemiah and Daniel had been reading the same book. They phrase it the same way. Namely, the commandments God gave in Exodus 20. Verse 5, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. The first element in all three of these places is a confessional element. Uh, the one praying includes himself with the guilty, as he says in our text tonight, verse 6, we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. It's easy to point out the sins of other people. It's easy to find uh, ways to blame other people for some mishap, some problem, and say, well, it's your fault. You did this, you did that. But we're, we're reluctant to admit our own uh, sin, our own shortcoming, our own faults, <clears throat> our own rebellion, our own iniquity and, um, against God. There are a lot of great words that deal with uh, uh, offending God, words like iniquity, trespass, sin. Sin, that short little three-letter word, is used a couple hundred times in the Bible, and yet it's a word nobody wants to utter any longer. But uh, he's including himself, along with all the other Jews of the nation, in their sin against God. And uh, he's saying, well, because they did this, your judgment has fallen upon us. He's including himself. <clears throat> the walls of the cities excuse me, were important in the ancient world to keep out enemy invaders. <coughs> excuse me. Think of the Great Wall of China that still stands today, built for that same purpose. And, um, Connie, you visited there, didn't you? Yes. How long is that wall? About a thousand miles? About a thousand miles. Amazing. They say you can, it can still be discerned from satellites in space, that wall. But since about World War I and the invention of airplanes, um, walls have been largely obsolete. Now the idea of a border wall, as it's been as in the news now, is still uh, a valuable um, pursuit because it, it prevents people trying to intrude on foot. So that does still have some purpose, but they said, well, you're not going to keep people out. They're just going to find a way to fly in and out of your country by airplane. That may be, but um, generally, those who are seeking to sneak into the country, run into the country, cross the border between us and Mexico be below us, and not just Mexican people. That, let me make that clear. I'm not singling out uh, Mexican people or people from South America or any other country. Um, for statistically, they, they represent the largest number of people crossing the country from that part of the world. But there are people from other countries, Middle East countries, people with um, on, on government watch lists as suspected terrorists. They have found gang members trying to import or export rather their gang activity here to the United States, drug dealers and so forth. Uh, and I think President Trump was right, saying they're not sending us their best and their brightest. If you, if you graduate high school and graduate college in Mexico, you probably have a career. You don't need to leave the country to come to the United States. 
and if you to pursue a career. And if you do, you're probably smart enough to know you have to do it by legal means. You can't sneak across the southern border with a college education and then hide in the shadows uh, picking vegetables for the rest of your life. That's not your intent. So you're more than likely going to come here by all the follow the rules and come by legal means, application for visa and so forth. And so the ones who do not come that way and just want to run in um, are flouting the laws to start with. Their first action is to flout the immigration law of the United States. And then it goes downhill from there. So they already, they enter the country, they are immediately a federal criminal. That's a federal crime. So, so I think the idea of a, a nation protecting its own borders, they have a right to, every country has a right to. Every nation has a right to decide who's worthy to be a citizen, who can benefit the country, um, what kinds of citizens do we want, um, and so on. So I, I don't mean to go on a rant about politics tonight, but as far as military protection, walls have been largely obsolete since about World War I with the advent of the aircraft. But walls are still very valuable. In the ancient times, um, the, the shooters, the archers, they would, have a, they would be able to have a high ground position when armies would come against the city walls. Um, note two words in verse 6. The word sins and the word sinned, S-I-N-N-E-D. And the first time the word sin appears is back in Genesis chapter 4. In fact, go back to Genesis 4. Genesis 4. And verse 7, God tells Cain, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. It's like a, a taskmaster, someone who causes you to serve it. Um, and sometimes you'll have the upper hand, sometimes it'll have the upper hand against you. I mentioned that on Sunday. Paul talked about the struggle within. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Um, and then the verse, verse 8 uh, says Cain rises up and murders his brother Abel. So the first time the word sin appears in the Bible is immediately connected to the first murderer in the Bible. Go to the book of Gen or Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13, and notice Genesis 13, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. The first time the word sinners appears is in connection with um, sexual perverts and deviants in the city of Sodom. Lucky number 13. Notice how many words are in that verse. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 words in the 13th verse of the 13th chapter, and uh, it is not a positive message. 13, for some reason, is universally seen as an unlucky number. But uh, be that as it is. So, the... Old Testament made a distinction between sinners, between the sinners and the righteous. I've talked about this many times before, but just briefly. Someone who was known for doing more bad than good was just labeled a sinner. Someone who had a good reputation of doing more good, being kind, more often than he was bad, was labeled the righteous. They seem to be designated this way. Sometimes the righteous are called a good man, a just man, a righteous man, and the guy on the other side is called um, an unrighteous man, the sinner, the wicked, the fool, and so forth. A number of different terms for 
both categories. That seemed to be how man was, uh, men and women were identified or designated in the Old Testament by their degree of obedience to God's revelation and commandments or their measure of disobedience against those commandments and those laws. God called some wicked or some uh, sinners and others righteous. But, and uh, the word sinners is still used, or rather was still used in that sense in the gospel. So let me show you a couple of references there. Uh, John chapter nine, John chapter 9, notice there verse 24, John chapter 9, and uh, verse 24, then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man, meaning the blind man, is a sinner. In fact, they figured... God knew ahead of time how rotten this guy would be, so he struck, he had him born with blindness. It's almost a Calvinistic proof text. But, <laughs> um, so they said, they use that, use it in that sense. Um, and also another reference is Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9. And I think it's verse, well, verses 10 and 11. It came to pass, as Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? See, the Pharisees put themselves in the positive category and uh, Figured it was everybody else was in the negative category. So, which actually, that, those two verses and others like them in the four Gospels are a good testimony to the fact that Jesus' ministry until Calvary was still in Old Testament times. People forget that. Before Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection, um, men were still designated either as a righteous man or a sinner based upon their, their degree of good conduct, behavior, and obedience to commandments, and so on. But um, in the New Testament, the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin, 1 John 5, 17. And uh, Isaiah says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6. So we're all guilty before God. Our our goodness could never stand up against the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our very best efforts to prove ourselves pious and worthy and uh, just and virtuous in the eyes of a holy God would never measure up alongside the perfect sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else falls by the wayside alongside his goodness. And it's that perfect righteousness that has to be covering you in order for God to let you into heaven. You can't earn it on your own by your own efforts. You have to depend upon the perfect virtue and merit and, and um, purity of the Lord Jesus Christ to become yours and credited to you or you're never going to get in. But men seem to want to justify themselves and um, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Paul says, Romans 3, verse 10. If all have sinned, then all are sinners. And if all are sinners, all need to be forgiven. I actually read some Catholic apologist saying, well, there are exceptions to that. What about uh, unborn babies? What about young babies before they understand anything? We don't consider them to be sinners. They haven't sinned. How can they be held accountable? When the Bible says all, all have sinned, it's using the word all um, without distinction. It's not saying all without any exceptions, but all without making a distinction. And 
Now, all that is is a Bible moron, a Bible blockhead, someone who's never read enough of the Bible to understand God allows for the grace to cover a child until they're old enough to know right and wrong and, and can then be responsible for their actions. Um, people that are feeble-minded, uh, as the Bible says, we're to comfort them in the book of Thessalonians, first second, second Thessalonians. Um, so, for people whose mental faculties prevent them from living a normal life and grasping important things, um, and that there again, that's that's almost on a case. That's almost a case by case issue. Some people with children and the severe spectrum, or the extreme spectrum of autism, or what they used to call retardation or Down syndrome now, um, it's hard to know what they know, what they perceive sometimes, what they understand. However, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I know people with uh, autistic children, it's slight enough, they can, they can grasp the world around them. They know when something's good and bad and Maybe they don't have a filter on what they say, and they just blurt it out loud and embarrass their dad and mom in public. Uh, and on the other end, you have cases of people whose uh, disability or their, or their condition is so extreme, you don't know if they are understanding the world around them at all, but they do know how to get dad and mom's attention when they need something, when they want something. They do know how to manipulate dad and mom. Um, so... But then again, little babies in the cradle, they know how to manipulate dad and mom. They know if I cry loud enough, someone's going to come feed me. Or cry, someone's going to come change me. Um, or cry, someone's going to pick me up and, and comfort me. Not that they have to be picked up, but they know if they do, someone's going to respond to it. And they can have parents running crazy, <laughs> taking care of their little needs. So, so the the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, but that's all without making any dis proper distinctions. However, God's grace does cover uh, particularly children who aren't old enough to comprehend the definitions between right and wrong. And we believe God um, watches out for them. But um, nobody likes the word sin anymore. Sin is a dirty word. Um, the Mormon church, the Mormons never use the word sin. That's been my experience in talking to them, reading their literature for years. They use, you know, our mistakes, our errors, our flaws, our mistakes in judgment, uh, and so forth. But they never want to use the word, the Bible word sin. They talk about the scriptures, but they don't, but they don't use scriptural language all the time. They want to sugarcoat it and cover it over and um, lapse in judgment so forth. And of course the liberal media does the same thing and the public education does the same thing. Sin is a word no one wants to talk about because sin, everyone, it's sort of universally understood. Sin suggests um, a crime against God, an offense that God takes notice of, for which you're going to give an answer, an account of yourself. And so we want to avoid that prospect at all costs, so let's describe it in any other way except the Bible's word, sin. Once you say sin, then I think Americans particularly have had enough exposure to the Bible, they know there's a verse that says all have sinned. Because they've heard it on television, someone handed a gospel tract to them, however they learned it. But one last note tonight. Notice verse 7, once again, let me read it again. Nehemiah prays and says, We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the, the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. God is very meticulous about the details and the elements, the different components of his word. Not just we've broken the, we've, we've ignored the message of, of your book. He says commandments, statutes, judgments. So God is very exacting. He wants, I heard someone suggest to me earlier this week, if God was going to write a book, or if God was going to write a Bible, give it to the world, 
How many Bibles would God need to write? Well, one. If it was written by God, one would be sufficient. And if God was going to give the world a book, would we really expect there to be errors and mistakes in it that needed to be second-guessed and doubted? No, if God's going to give the world a book, he would give the world a perfect book. And if he could give the world a perfect book, he could give the world a book that didn't need man's help to uh, correct it, to modify it, to improve it, to rewrite it, alter it, change it, update it, revise it, and so forth. God could give the world a book and without man's help just fine. And um, as a Bible-believing Christian, we have, I would say, if God would give the world a book, it would be a perfect book. I can't imagine God doing anything that wasn't perfect. And if giving the world a book that had his revelation in it, then I have to believe it would be a book without any mistakes or errors in it that needed changing have 100% trust and confidence in it. 